to not hear that there have been recent policy changes in various jurisdictions with regard to vaccines becoming so-called mandatory, and I'll explain that so-called in a minute. Um, but of course, um, California in 2015 removing um, all exemptions except medical exemptions um, for compliance with vaccination requirements. Australia in 2016, we spent a lot of time at the last meeting um, for those who were here talking about no jab, no pay. So I've deliberately not included any discussion of that this year, but of course I'm sure it will come out in the, in the discussion if people want. And then this year we've had both Italy and France announce that they're introducing um, policies with mandatory vaccination. So I think the first question we need to ask ourselves, and a lot of this, a lot of what the slides you're seeing are the consequences of me thinking through some of these questions, and of course you may think them through differently, and if so, you know, I'd love to hear about it at the end. Um, I, when I asked myself what vaccine mandates are seeking to govern, it was fairly self-explanatory to me that they were seeking to govern acceptance rather than access. But as I'll demonstrate in a moment, um, there are potentially some other ways we could think about this as well. Um, but one of the things, the reason I said so-called when I talked about mandates is that there's not actually a clear established definition of what we mean when we talk about vaccines being mandatory. So we don't actually know what it is that we're referring to and we don't know what the tipping point is that suddenly might make something mandatory or not mandatory. So there's this term will be used in discourse and in political discourse and within our field, um, but people might be meaning different things when, when they say mandatory. So I made a slide. And um, what I've sought to do on this slide is we like continuums in this research area. So I made a continuum that um, on one side is, is sort of the settings in which vaccination is completely voluntary. And at the other end um, includes what I would regard to be the most harsh measures the state could take against those who don't vaccinate, and that's fines and imprisonment. Um, and, um, but I will get to this in a moment, all right, because it, this, it's not this simple. But anyway, imagine it is just for a moment. Imagine we can just look at it according to uh, what the kind of stated policy is. Then in the top line, I've talked about requirements that are linked to public goods. And by public goods, I mean things like, um, you know, public daycare and public schools. So along the kind of more voluntary end of the axis, you can have requirements about vaccination that say you've got to be vaccinated to access these public goods, but um, there can be exemptions available for those who don't want to comply. And the next more strict level of that is where there's requirements related to access to public goods and the, oh, there's not really exemptions, only for medical situations. Um, down here, I've said that there's, I've suggested it's a separate category when it's actually not public goods, but in financial incentives. I think there's a qualitative difference with regard to money coming into your pocket than there is with regard to accessing something in your community. So the, the equivalent is, you know, you can get the goodies if you, um, if you comply, but you can also get out of complying with some effort and still get the goodies. Or this one over here, you can't get the goodies unless you comply and only a medical exemption will still get you the goodies. Now, um, the last thing I wanted to do was ask myself that question around how each of these kind of affects both the access and the acceptance equation. But I found it wasn't helpful to think about access and it was more helpful to think about this term complacency that we also encounter in the literature about vaccination, which I know is a, a qualitatively different thing, but in terms of thinking, thinking through who mandates are supposed to work on, um, I, I thought about, you know, because we don't need to worry about the people who are going to turn up anyway, and we, we do need to think about access, but um, I'm trying to kind of keep that out of this picture at the moment. But there's clearly a group of people that we might regard as, and, and access can certainly play a role in this, but I'm not going to conflate the two, who just for various reasons might not be getting to the clinic. And this is all kind of working in a setting, which I realise is not the real world, in which we assume that vaccines are available and easily accessed. So in that imaginary setting, the people who wouldn't get them are the complacent, and those who actually don't want them. So at the voluntary end of the spectrum, there is no compulsion for either category. It's all about, once you've got all the access levers in place, it's really all about many of the techniques we've talked about today in terms of getting people, that, that, that drawing in that I liked from the social marketing discussion, um, actually just getting people to get off their butt and get in and get vaccinated. Once we start moving on to requirements linked to public goods, um, and also financial incentives, sorry, financial incentives with exceptions. So either way, 
you can get the goodies if you're not vaccinated with some effort. I've suggested what's going on here is the state is queuing for complacency. These policies are really about getting people off their butt and into the clinic, and that's precisely because rejectors can access them with effort. So they're not really about accessing rejectors so much. It's actually about saying, you know, we'll try and get people in, and if you don't want to come in and you go to a bit of effort, that's OK. At this end, I'm suggesting, again, the state is queuing for complacency, but by excluding or denying rejectors, the policy is actually actively targeting these people too, in either form. Once you get to this end, I sort of speculate that the policy is now actually about motivating those um, who are rejectors. And the policy is working on the complacent because they don't want to face the penalty. But now I'm suggesting that certainly in the, I'm not suggesting this has always been the case in contexts where these have been introduced, but I'm suggesting now perhaps the way we might frame these is that um, you, know, you come in with a penalty and that's going to get everyone off their butt and those who really don't want to get off their butt are going to face the penalty. So that's a very oversimplified version of it, but that's how I've kind of um, conceptualised it. But as I said, it's really not that simple and it doesn't work on just one continuum. It's almost like you need multiple dimensions of continui, if that is a word, at, at work here. And um, some questions that, of course, underpin and, and problematise the slide I just showed you. One is really, are all related to, is it really mandatory? And go back to this idea that we don't actually have a fixed definition. So one question, of course, is if there are exemptions, are they easy or difficult to get? So never mind what type, as we talked about on the previous page, but whatever there is, how easy or difficult are they to get? And how often do you have to get them vis-a-vis -vis how often one might have to get a vaccine? Um, and then just some you know, interesting other points, like some US states have criminal consequences, so they're right back at the harsh end, but they've got exemptions, and I didn't map them on my continuum, but just showing you it can be more complex. And then also, um, you know, just some interesting things that can happen with exemptions. For example, in Washington, once, and we heard about this earlier, once um, people had to start going to see a medical, um, you know, a, a healthcare worker in order to have their, um, their any type of exemption validated, what, what one study reports is that people started get, even though they were able to get other kinds of exemptions, the number of medical exemptions arose. So that's kind of interesting. I'm just offering this as the kind of details that can play out when policies are implemented. Then there's a whole bunch of questions around requirements. So they might be, you know, they might appear to exist, but who enforces them? Or are they enforced? And how often? And for whom? You know, which category of person is going to experience the consequence of this? Um, and is it going to be a universal thing or are certain categories of people going to be targeted? And then what are the, what are the consequences of their non-compliance? What is going to happen to them? So how do these consequences bite and who do they bite? Again, going back to that earlier question of, of are they going to be applied to everybody or certain categories? And really the take home from this is that just because a policy exists doesn't mean it's going to be enforced. And it's, if it's not enforced, then can it really be said to exist in, in the way that it might appear to be presented. Now I want to spend a little bit of time looking at rationales that states may offer or that we may be able to explore and um, expose for why mandates might be introduced. And here this is not me offering any endorsement of these policies or rationales. It's me again thinking through, well, you know, in what situations um, might we see these coming in and the kind of conversations that would come around that. So the first I've categorised as moral. And in my own country of Australia, there's been a, a discourse that's been um, introduced by the right of politics for over a decade, um, and that's this term mutual obligation. And what it really means is if you're going to get goodies from the state, it doesn't come with no strings. And it's quite, a, um, it's quite an unpleasant discourse in my opinion, and it's been used to target the vulnerable, such as job seekers or welfare recipients. With the job seekers, it's been used to... Um, require them to complete very onerous uh, job search diaries, work for the dole for perhaps three days a week. So you've got to do a, you've got to do a lot of work in order to get um, unemployment benefits. And now we're seeing the same discourse introduced uh, with regard to uh, welfare recipients, and there's trials ongoing right now of um, people to see if they're taking drugs. And if you're taking drugs, you can actually have your, um, illegal drugs obviously, uh, you can have your welfare uh, money quarantined. So this term has explicitly also been employed by um, the government, the, the right-leaning government in Australia to, to 
bring to this vaccination concept as well and mandatory vaccination. But I would suggest under this moral heading as well, there can be, a, I guess, a nicer or a more appealing version of the moral argument. And this is around um, you know, linking it to the public good and saying that um, if, if other people in the community are accessing this public good, and this can be with regard to things like childcare and schools, um, it's, it's, it, if you're not vaccinated and you're going there, it can actually affect the entitlement of other people to be able to enjoy these public goods. So it's a different kind of moral argument about communities. Then there can be a whole crisis rationale, and I think that's certainly what we're seeing at the moment. And the crisis might be unfolding, um, you know, that something like the, the Disneyland measles outbreak could be regarded as a, at the time as a kind of unfolding crisis. Then there might be an impending crisis. So this is someone's looking at the numbers and getting worried and starting a conversation about what the numbers might mean. And of course, there's also the idea that a crisis could be manufactured by, um, you know, by certain forces as well. So I think here we have to ask us, you know, what do the numbers tell us about, about any kind of crisis discourse and, and the legitimacy of using this crisis framing? Then I've suggested that there might be a, a rationale around effectiveness. So if, um, you know, the questions around um, um, so-called mandates, whatever they are, targeting the population that you intended to target, and are they working? So one thing that I, I want to be clear on is that I believe that mandates are about changing behaviour but not beliefs. And so, you know, and you don't always have to change beliefs to change behaviours, we, we would like to. Um, but then it's an empirical question of, of, well, is it, does it, is it, is it actually having the, that effect? And then finally, I've, I've included this term affective, alluding to the idea of effect or our or affect, our, our personal experience of emotion. And here what I'm trying to get at is we might want to stop and ask ourselves, who is this um, policy actually working for? And what I refer to here is the work by a scholar of international relations called Lee Jones, who looked at when countries impose sanctions on other countries for, um, for contravening international law or international norms. And of course, this is always a pertinent uh, conversation right now as well. So what he found was that when people, um, or when states um, seek to impose sanctions on other countries, everyone's kind of like, yeah, you know, we'll impose the sanctions, that'll show them. And he actually went, he wanted to uncover that process and say, well, do the sanctions work? Do they, you know, everyone thinks sending sanctions is the kind of endpoint, but the endpoint surely has to be, do they work? And so he went in and had a good look and found, surpri well, surprisingly or unsurprisingly, depending where you sit, that frequently they didn't work and frequently they didn't have that effect. And what he suggested and found in his research was that actually the sending of the sanctions was often much more about the sender than the recipient. So I'm suggesting in this context, it could be about a kind of emotional experience for those wanting to punish people who don't comply with vaccination, but also it might serve political ends, as Jones found in his own study. It, um, sending sanctions might mean a lot more at home than it does overseas where you sought to send them, if that makes sense. And finally, um, I want to suggest the idea that um, occurring within this, this imposition of mandates may actually be a form of trickery. So. Um, if there is sort of political demand or demand in the community, something, you know, resembling a mandate might emerge, but um, the devil might lie in the detail and perhaps it was never really going to be a mandate after all. So having explored this, I now just want to kind of categorise mandates within the forms of governance available to, to states with regard to vaccination. And this won't be anything new to any of you, but I'm hoping it might just be an interesting and thought-provoking way of framing mandates within the other activities that we're here to discuss at this meeting. So there are various tools that the state has at its disposal to control us. Um, and the most old fashioned and kind of well known would be hierarchy. And this is really the state using its monopoly of coercive power and its control of economic means to do stuff with money and laws, basically legislation and finance. And so it's, this is where mandates fit, right? This is kind of old fashioned, top down control. Then there's the stuff that those of us in this room are much more comfortable with, one of which is persuasion, which of course can include campaigns, social marketing, communication strategies. And here I suggest that this is again, something that governments you know, are key involved in, but they can have partners that include us, whoever we are. Um, and then 
you know, some scholars, and, and I agree with them, are now framing nudge as something different than persuasion. The key distinction being that persuasion is about engaging with us as active agents who consciously um, are involved in making decisions, and it's kind of giving us a lot of credit and working with our capacity to reason and reach good conclusions. Whereas nudging can be much more about orienting towards uncritical acceptance. Um, and again, it's, you know, this is something governments can be doing, it's also something healthcare providers can be doing with regard to the presumptive approach that Opel has written about, for example, but also um, you know, recall reminder schemes at the practice level. So I think there's a distinction there between those two modes of governance, but I think that both of them are probably a lot more appealing to the people in this room, perhaps, than, than this top kind. And of course, the point to make as we start to think about societies that are introducing mandatory vaccination in whatever mandatory means, is that persuasion and nudge don't go away. They remain open to policy and practice actors in societies with mandates, and the state can also um, structure and make use of these tools. And of course, um, if governments are smart, they will do so, right? Like, if you use these forms of governance in association with each other, they're likely to be effective in, in the goal of actually changing the behaviour that you want, but also importantly, they can promote the norm. So although I've suggested that mandates don't change, um, they don't change our beliefs, they only change our behaviour, in time, perhaps they can change our beliefs through, through processes of norming, but I'm, I'm not going to drill into that right now. Um, so, acceptance in the age of ma mandates, what does all of this mean for those of us here in the room? I've kind of tried to consider what our lives and works look like before and what they might look like now. And I want to suggest that, you know, and when I talk about this us, I'm framing those of us in this room as researchers and people working in government, working in, you know, delivering programs around vaccination. I, I, I hope I've got that right in that that's who we are. And so I, I see that our job used to be one of persuading, well, for those of you who are not yet in societies with mandates, this is still your job. Um, sort of to persuade, for researchers, it's about persuading governments and funding bodies to fund the work we do and, if, and, to, you know, and to actually fund and implement it. So, and those in practice, also, obviously, to apply and implement the, and evaluate the kind of research-led um, methods of encouraging people to vaccinate. So our whole thing was that we, show, we can show you how to convince people to vaccinate at a community and practice level. This is, this is our value add to this whole proposition. And arguably, in, in societies with mandates, that's changed. And, and maybe it hasn't, and I'll get to this, but some of the things we might want to think about is, firstly, is our job, or could our job now be, to evaluate the impact of mandates, and, and I think that it is, including, of course, the negative and unintended consequences on um, you know, intended and unintended recipients, um, and is it to promote tweaks, or you know, some in this room might say that the ideal would be to repeal them. Um, is our job to put attention into access. You know, we conceptualise access and acceptance as different things. But um, if, if mandates have been rolled out in haste by countries who are like, oh, rates are falling, oh, I better make it mandatory, have they made sure that they have covered every single access stone before they do that? Because if they haven't, then we've got a huge social justice problem. So what, what is our job with regard to access in that, in that case? But finally, and here I'll um, echo the, the words and the spirit of Joe last night, is that you know, no matter what, I think the role of us is still to persuade, you know, back to this, governments still have to fund <laughs> acceptance work. It's, it's still, and, and do acceptance work. It is still so crucial. Arguably, it's even more crucial now on a moral basis. If you are going to make people do something, you know, surely it's, it's worth the investment in trying to get them on board at the same time, right? Um, and also, of course, there's an instrumental rationale that says the same thing. If you employ multiple modes of governance, you're likely to be more successful. So it should stay packaged in. And, you know, to, to, to repeat Joe, we're like, we can't stop. Like, this, this work can't stop. The risk, of course, is that once governments have introduced mandates, do they think it has? Do they think that that's, the job is done? Um, the other point to make is that has the content of our work changed? 
and here I'm, I'm going to get a little bit political science, but, um, you know, one of the things we see and we, we can see in the history of mandatory vaccination in, in, in different countries with different diseases in different contexts, that the minute the state starts telling people what to do, then there's a language of libertarianism that is um, pushed back against that. You know, you don't want the state to, to control me, my body, my family, my choice. And so in, in societies where mandates are introduced, I'm interested in whether this discourse kind of re-emerges and, and becomes salient in its own right? Um, or is it just a kind of front for the same old beliefs and values that we would understand to, to underscore vaccine refusal in the first place? So is it, is it just the same kind of language and beliefs with a new rhetoric added over the top? Or do we start having a qualitatively different conversation about state power? And if the latter is true, then does persuasion work actually need to take it up to this level as well? And do we have to start having conversations around libertarianism versus communitarianism? And, you know, I know most of you in this room won't like this, but I'm going to ask the question about whether, you know, acceptance work has to then start, become, start to become an act of legitimising state power. And, you know, the more palatable version of that is to say, well, it's, it's the state is doing this at the behest of the community. The community needs this. But still, this is a, this is a conversation that those of us who are just focusing on, um, you know, the, the kind of more narrow realm of vaccination and behaviour in that regard, suddenly this is a bigger and deeper conversation. And, you know, one place I would suggest, of course, that, um, that, that acceptance work would still and inarguably have a place, although may still need to be advocated for, is that, you know, um, not all states apply mandates, and, and generally in this case they're not usually enforced, but or enforced, you know, meaningfully, um, but not all vaccines necessarily fall under the mandate. So in that case, firstly, there could be some really bad unintended consequences of only privileging some and not saying that, you know, you suggest the other ones are not important. And there could certainly be a place for acceptance work around the so-called not important vaccines. Um, but look, I have just touched on, you know, this issue and, and my thinking around it. So uh, the next thing we're going to be doing is hearing from, from countries, two countries where mandatory vaccination has been introduced and one where it has been, I suppose, flirted with, perhaps considered, but avoided. Um, so, but before I move on to introducing our speakers, each of whom will speak for um, 15 to 20 minutes, I think it's 15 minutes, 15, anyway, whatever, um, I, I do also want to acknowledge um, a conversation I had with Julie Leesk around this. So Julie's not here, but um, I, I have to acknowledge the um, input that she had into me developing these ideas that I've shared with you today. Okay, so our first speaker is going to be uh, Christine Justin, who joins us from the French Public Health National Agency, now I'll have some terrible French, Santé Publique, France. Uh, Christine leads the Infectious Risks Prevention Unit there. Her background is as a physician and she has a prestigious history of roles in the French um, national health with a strong focus on immunisation. So she is going to tell us all about the big news coming out of France. <laughs> 